good afternoon, and I hope you had some good um, experiences this afternoon in your breakout sessions and working groups. In a few minutes, you'll be introduced to our Dean's panel, which is made of three leaders whose business schools are redesigning management education. Manuel Escudero, the panel's moderator, is the man synthesizing their efforts and others on a global scale. Manuel is the special advisor to the United Nations Global Compact, a strategic policy initiative for businesses committed to aligning their operations and strategies with 10 universally accepted principles in the areas of human rights, labor, environment, and anti-corruption. He serves as the executive director of the Research Center for the UN Global Compact at the Levin Institute and is senior fellow of the Levin Institute. Manuel is also head of the Secretariat of the United Nations Principles for Responsible Management Education, or PRIME. And this, as many of you already know, is an organization initiated by his work and many conversations between him and David Cooperider over the years. And interestingly, the framework for the PRIME are a direct output of the first global forum for business as an agent of world benefit held in this very room in 2006. The six principles seek to establish a process of continuous improvement among institutions of management education. And they're in order to develop a new generation of business leaders capable of managing the complex challenges faced by business and society in the 21st century. Manuel himself has also had a long career as a management educator, mostly at IE Business School in Spain. His long experience in management education globally and his extensive high-level work with leading global networks on management education reform make him a perfect moderator for, today, for today's Dean's panel, and I'm pleased to introduce him now. So thank you very much. Well, thank you for this very kind presentation. Uh, dear colleagues, um, <clears throat> when we started uh, Prime, that was three years ago, sustainability was already, as David would say, the business opportunity of the 21st century. And let me tell you, by the way, how Prime was started. It was started in the staircase of, of the business school here in Case Western Reserve University. We were preparing the first global forum, and I said Nancy Adler was waiting for us in one of the rooms. And I saw David, I mean, we coincide in the stairs case, and I said to David, what do you think you know, about creating a global call with some principles for responsible education in the style of the global compact principles? And David didn't exit, hesitate at all. He said, we have to go for it. And that was it. And I would say that his acceptance and his uh, support at that moment, I, I think that uh, encouraged me to continue with that. And ever since then, we have been continuing together as tra uh, tra uh, fellow travelers in this uh, journey of the Global Forum uh, uh, that we are having here as the second time and the Global Forum for Responsible Management Education that we had in December and will continue in the future. But at that moment already, at that moment already, I think it was true that sustainability was already the business opportunity of the 21st century. So much so that at that moment the Global Compact already had around 5,000 companies on board and CSR had gone international, had gone global at that moment. But and I don't want to be gloomy here because we have been listening to so much energy, so much optimism about what we can do in the future. But let me remind you the problems that we have at the present. I think that that is also important, and I don't want to be gloom and doom here, but I have to tell you that 2008, even if the movement of CSR was already international, the year 2008 has, in, uh, I, I would say, unveiled to us a, a global agenda and has made more evident this necessity of sustainability. If we go to the year 2008, you will remember that at the beginning of the year, we had uh, an energy crisis, an energy global crisis, and then we had a food crisis. And suddenly we realized at around June that 100 million more people were in danger with hunger in the world. And we realized also at that moment that 
as, ye as yesterday was uh, Jeffrey Sachs was telling to us, we live in a crowded planet where we are pushing the natural resources to the limit. And if we, were ha we have had last year uh, a food crisis, an energy crisis, tomorrow we are going to have a water crisis. And the day after tomorrow we are going to have probably humanitarian crisis related to the climate change and disasters. So we are living in a world in which we need a, cl a more clever management, a more clever system of global, global governance. And that's part of the agenda. The second part we learned in the second half of the year 2008. And you know as well as me about the economic and financial downturn that we are experiencing. And you know as well as I do about the agenda that we have in front of us with that downturn. We are talking here about the need for a concerted recovery out of the recession. We are talking here about the need for new international financial regulations. We are talking here about extra funds to prevent the disastrous consequences of, of, uh, of the recession and uh, of the exit of capital in many developing countries. And that probably is going to entail a reform of the IMF. We are talking here, probably in the middle term, about the need for a new monetary system that is anchored, not in the dollar, but in a more stable multi-currency proposition. And we are talking here also about rethinking the functioning of global capitalism, certainly from the financial point of view, but probably in many other aspects. And the third aspect that we discovered last year, in the year 2008, was that we are not anymore living in a unipolar world. We are in a multipolar world that is not anymore unipolar, is not anymore Western-oriented, where we have new powerful, although still silent, partners in China, India. And this world that is multipolar cannot go on being run in a unilateralist way. Multilateralism is one of the challenges that we have in front of us. Because if we don't have multilateralism, we can see in the future, for the next 20 years, a situation of fragmented alliances and doubtful leaderships. And that, my friends, means that we live in very dangerous times. So we live in very exciting times. And we have seen that abundantly during these two days. But we also live in very complicated and danger dangerous times. And the question here is, well, what can business schools do you know, in front of this global agenda? Uh, certainly, business schools cannot solve all the problems. But they can be part of the solution in some important and significant problems. Uh, but I would like to ask uh, our guests today, should we continue in this situation with a business as usual mentality? Well, we all know that at this moment, there is an emerging and very important public debate on the effectiveness of business schools. We are really in the middle of the debate at this moment. And there is not easy answer to the question is whether or not business schools have certain part on the financial crisis that we have seen. Is there is not an easy answer, and certainly I will not be the one that says that business schools are guilty, a guilty party. I prefer to look at the challenges in the future, but I think that we have to recognize something. I think that we have to recognize that we have not taught our students in the past about the social and environmental impact of their decisions as future professionals. And I will give you a very simple example. You all know, as well as I do, that we teach in business schools that a leverage of a 30% for a company is a wise thing to do. A company should have at least a 30% of funds that are not owned by the company to run properly the business. But did we teach, we have taught, thought, and we have taught about the social consequences of a 1,000% leverage? We haven't. And I think that out of that, there are things that we have to learn in the future. Secondly, um, 
and with CSR having gone global, as I said before, we have to ask ourselves, and I would like to ask our guests, are responsible companies, those companies that they have already in their DNA, responsibility and sustainability as part of their, their strategy and their daily operations, those companies, I say, are satisfied with the uh, education we are giving to future professionals? And I would say that there is certain doubt there. And in the Global Forum for Responsible Management Education, some uh, months ago, Asrich, as a partner of Prime, presented a, survey, presented a survey, and the survey indicated very clearly that less, less than 8% of, of, of representative or responsible companies were satisfied with the teachings that we give to students in business schools in terms of sustainability, in terms of climate change challenges, in terms of dealing with emerging markets, in terms of complexity and com uh, uh, connectedness as skills that the new professionals have to have. And the third question that maybe we have to ask ourselves is that do we need a consolidation of the legitimacy of business schools? And as you know, you know as well as I do, that now almost every week we have a new article, maybe in New York, New York Times, maybe in the Financial Times, uh, talking about this, these questions. By the way, I would like to recommend you uh, an article in the, um, uh, an excellent interview with uh, Rakesh uh, Kurana uh, in Business Week, I believe, uh, that really is very telling about what we are talking here. But what I would like to tell you, after being in the last month around the world talking with many business schools, is that everywhere there is a kind of slight confusion about how to proceed in the future. And I would say that what we have, uh, are starting to have on the table and in the agenda is a redefinition of the future of business education. So, that's part of the situation. I'm sorry that I'm asking the hard questions here, but uh, I think that we have very excellent partners to answer these questions today. In Prime, we are really believe very strongly, uh, and we defend very strongly, a uh, leadership model. We believe that business schools really get into a mode of change towards sustainability only if the deans are convinced that that is something that is necessary to happen. Why? Because they are the ones that, of course, along with a committed group of faculty members, but they are the ones that set the tone top down, and that is very important signal in the business school. They, they are the ones that design the policies, they want the ones that design and, design and decide the incentives for change, and therefore, all that is extremely important. So today we have the privilege of having with, uh, with us three of those very important and crucial agents for change, three deans with which to talk, to talk about these three questions. I would like to pose the questions very clearly now. Do we continue as business as usual? Are there demands that are not being met at this moment by the emerging and growing movement of responsible corporations around us? And what is the future of business education? And I would say also of management education in general in an epoch of sustainability. So let me introduce uh, Ira Jackson, the Dean of the Peter Drucker Graduate uh, School of Management uh, I cannot really stress the importance of this school that is trying to really reproduce and keep alive the spirit of the one that is the father, I would say, ideologically, of all of us, Peter Drucker. And let me introduce to you also Marian Alavi, who is the vice dean of the Emery Goizueta Business School, and finally, the dean of this business school here in Case Western Reserve University, Mohan Reddy of uh, the Waterhead School of, of Management. Those are three leaders 
of leading, and certainly I can see that from the vantage point of, 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 of Prime, leading schools trying to engineer the needed change. So please welcome them with me. There we go, sorry, got, it, got ahead of it. Um, thank you, Manuel, for the opportunity, and, and David, most particularly to you, what happened, uh, to give us the chance and uh, to be the catalyst for helping to reshape uh, the future of management education. It, it was launched really here at the first global summit. Uh, Manuel is taking it forward through the principles of responsible management education. And, uh, in the brief time that I've got at the podium, I thought I might first reflect a little bit on how we got to this place, this dilemma, this deep hole that we're in as a profession, uh, suggest a few guiding principles that might, uh, in a Senge-like way, uh, guide us uh, forward to share with you just a couple of examples of what's happening at my one modest institution, and then suggest that this is a a uh, transformational moment for all of us in this huge sector. So without dwelling on too much of the past, um, I think perhaps for those of you who aren't academics, you might take some solace on us that we have a structural problem. Most of us uh, quantify research empirically and we look back at what's happened. And we do an excellent job documenting the past, but we have this structural dilemma that uh, almost prevents us from seeing what's out over the horizon. It hasn't ha yet happened. We can't document it. We can't uh, provide an empirical basis for analyzing it. And therefore, we're slightly at a loss as to how to contribute to the future at the cutting edge. So we have this almost classical dilemma of racing forward while looking in the rearview mirror. And it's undeniable, uh, you can't sit in the conference as I have the last day and a half and not acknowledge that practice is way ahead of the academy. There is thrilling stuff happening in the real world that we haven't caught up with. And our students are way ahead of us, way ahead of us. Uh, and they demand uh, cutting edge insights and businesses with whom we're closely aligned are looking to us um, to know much more than we bring to the table. So there's a structural misalignment that undermines our relevance and, and leads to many missed opportunities where we could be contributing much more substantially. But beyond these structural impediments are some uh, serious normative uh, issues that I think we need confronting, and I don't want to be the skunk at the garden party, but um, this financial crisis that we've experience that we continue to experience has cost the global economy $50 trillion. It started here in America in the subprime lending colossal mess. It's led already to 50 million jobs being lost globally. Uh, what is our culpability? Uh, who packaged the subprime loans? Who was rewarded for the tranches. Uh, the loans were called ninja loans, no interest, no job, liar loans. The loans, when they were securitized and bundled, were called grenade loans, because you would take a tranche of a billion or $10 billion worth of liar loans, and you would sell them in the secondary market, and it was like pulling the pin on a grenade and throwing it over the transom and hoping that it didn't blow up in your face. Those were our graduates who did those things. So are we guilty of benign neglect or contributory negligence? I'm not sure um, we have to dwell upon that, but if we were doctors, I think we'd have a difficult time getting malpractice insurance right now. So what about there are some who say that, well, these kids come in with these values, you know, greed, and, you know, by the time they get to graduate school, you know, do we nurture them or is it in their nature? But Business Week has a cover story that says 56% of all MBAs admit to cheating 
while on their way. And I think we have a little reckoning to do as to whether we are enablers or change agents. And as Akesh Karana in the New York Times and in his thoughtful book postulates, are we a profession or a vocation? Um, so I, I don't mean to suggest that I have any answers. Drucker taught us to ask the right question. Uh, a couple of thoughts about where we might want to be headed and how we might want to, uh, what direction we might want to proceed. I would suggest at the outset that we approach this topic with enormous humility, if not absolute contrition, uh, and that we'd be much more attentive to learning and listening uh, to the marketplace, to our students, to the world of best practice, and uh, get off the pedestal which presumed that we had the answers. Um, Drucker said that management is first and foremost a liberal art. This is lost fancy in the academy, but he felt that philosophy and archaeology and anthropology and political science and theology and creativity was just as important as finance and accounting and marketing. And I think that some of us are trying to preserve this notion and return to the notion of management as a liberal art. And lest folks think that this is, um, you know, the, the left fringe or um, a kooky idea, I, I was recently at West Point, the, the citadel of, you know, war. If we're the citadel of capitalism, uh, they're the citadel of war. And I, I was amazed and pleased to learn that every cadet, every officer in the United States Army who goes to our military academy at West Point, from the very outset of the founding of West Point until this day, has to take art as a requirement of graduation. The premise being that you can't do what they need to do, lead in the field of battle, unless you have perspective and inspiration. So I think we need to democratize and decentralize the profession and learn from you and others. Um, I think we need to much more aggressively pursue uh, the transdisciplinary frontiers that we've been exploring together these last two days. I don't think it's limited to design. I think that's a very nice and, and comfortable and, and complementary skill set and perspective, but I think if we're going to fulfill our ambition and society's needs for schools of business and management, we also have to develop linkages and be much more aggressive frontier transgressors with schools of public policy, engineering, education, health, uh, the social sector. I think we need systems thinking. I don't know how we got to where we are, where we're in silos and disciplines. Uh, you know, Drucker, he didn't have the first and last word on management, but he was probably the greatest management thinker uh, we've yet produced, and he was a systems thinker. In fact, he called himself a social ecologist. And I think we need to bake and imbue responsibility into everything we do. I, I was impressed with what Roger had to say about going deep and wide and dynamic. I think we also have to uh, apply some principles. And one of them ought to be not only do no harm, but do good. And I'm not embarrassed as a business school dean to say that I challenge my students to not only do well, but to do good. Otherwise, go somewhere else, please. There's too much of an opportunity here. So a couple of modest innovations at one small school, uh, the Drucker School of Management. We call our, ourselves a school of management because Drucker thought that the central organizing concept in society was the organization, not business, not government, not the social sector. He said it's, it's organizations in these sectors that need to be effectively managed, ethically led, and had a responsibility together to society. So we require every student at the Drucker School to take a course from all of us on the faculty. We don't have disciplines, although we all come from disciplines. We don't have a marketing department and a finance department and an accounting department and a strategy department and an OB department. We have a school and we approach learning as an integrative uh, exercise and we all teach a gateway course, which 
orients our students to these values and to Drucker in all his dimensions. I'm getting the hook? Okay, I'm sorry. I'll try to go fast. Okay. Uh, we, uh, I'll skip through some of this other stuff. What we're doing is just illustrative. Others are doing things that are more thrilling, uh, but a couple of things that we're doing may be instructive uh, for others and um, they feel right for us. Uh, we've transformed Drucker's archives where you know a limited number of scholars would uh, have access to Peter's writings and we've transformed it into a into an institute which is a think tank and an action tank that allows us as a professional school of management to go well beyond the academy, to democratize and disseminate and to reach many more publics than we could than simply through an MBA or an executive MBA degree. So we've established Drucker societies around the world in, in 20 countries. We'll be opening up 10 new Drucker societies in China this year, Vietnam, Korea, Japan, uh, New Zealand, Australia, Brazil, uh, around the world, folks who like us but perhaps not uh, needing uh, or being able to afford the luxury of an MBA want to pursue Drucker-like principles of effective management, ethical leadership, and social responsibility in their organizations. Uh, we're taking a lot of this to scale in this coming year, which would have been the 100th birthday of Peter Drucker, because we want the 21st century to be a, a Drucker century. We don't think that this guy's insights uh, were relevant for the past. We think he was spot on about the future. And interestingly, he wasn't uh, a futurist. He said what he did was look out the window and see the future that's already here. And I think that's what under David's leadership, we've all been doing the last couple of days. This is a transformational moment for management education. This could and should be a period, a rich, nutritious period of experimentation, churning, creativity, breakthrough, disruptive innovation. And I think we can learn not only from one another, from Case Western and from Emory and from other great and pioneering business schools, but from businesses and especially from the social sector. There are some examples of new organizations, hybrid organizations and elsewhere, that if I think Drucker were alive today, these are the organizations he'd be writing about. He'd be saying these are best practice. The Teach for America, I'm proud to say as an American, is tougher to get into this year than Wharton. And the largest social club at the Harvard Business School is no longer the investment banking or venture capital club, it's the Social Entrepreneurship Club. So I think we need to do lots of open source learning as, manage, as management educators, and we need to do some reverse engineering, listening and importing from, a, from abroad, just as Grameen Bank taught us. You know, this, we seem to have thought that we had most of the answers about finance, but it was a model from Bangladesh that, that that taught us about microfinance, and there are so many examples elsewhere. B schools should be beta sites of innovation. I take my inspiration from a new institute at MIT called the Legatum Center for Technology, Entrepreneurship, and Development, which is attempting uh, to bring breakthrough technological ideas to the, the bottom of the pyramid. I think we can learn from many others, including our students who are, who are who are spear carriers and, and champions of everything that we've been describing today. Uh, I also think it's time to go back to basics and to not be embarrassed about saying uh, it's back to the future. I, I guess I'd have an argument, but that's not the point of this uh, forum with Roger about the Hippocratic Oath and what uh, my friend Angel Cabrera is doing at the Thunderbird School. Maybe this is. Uh, maybe you didn't catch the reference, but he's requiring students to take an oath. It's not a new oath. It's the oath that every Athenian had to take to be a citizen of Athens 2,500 years ago. And, and it simply says, I'll not only obey and revere the laws of Athens, but I pledge that as a citizen, my responsibility is to leave Athens more beautiful, with greater opportunity, and more justice then I inherited it. I thought that was the premise of America as well. I thought that's what the pilgrims came over and said when they landed on Pilgrim Rock about forming a city on a hill, that the notion of stewardship, 
that we leave it better than we found it. The Navajos say we don't inherit the land from our parents, we borrow it from our children. So I'm not embarrassed about thinking that uh, there's a great opportunity here and to invoke uh, my namesake, uh, who once said that the best way to predict the future is to create it. So we've got a wonderful opportunity to do just that. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Maryam Alavi, and I'm the Vice Dean at the Goizueta Business School at Emory University. I'm uh, delighted to be here uh, this afternoon to share with you some um, of the ideas and some of the designs that we have come up with in terms of uh, management education. About three years ago, in my role as the Vice Dean, I was given the task of uh, spearheading an initiative to uh, design learning experiences that develop sustainable values and competencies for business school graduates. So you kind of see these keywords that we are, there have been discussed uh, yesterday and today, design, sustainability, values. And I am adding the word competencies because uh, even having all the values sustainability, social responsibility, social entrepreneurship, global citizenship, that in and of itself is not enough. To enact on those values, to take effective action, uh, our belief is that there are certain competencies that also need to be developed in business school graduates that go beyond having knowledge and functional area expertise. And the idea of sustainable competencies really are, refers to those competencies that are enduring and continue to serve the graduate throughout their professional lives and perhaps in their personal lives. So with that, the idea was that, okay, we certainly need to start with uh, the right values as the base, as guiding action and behavior, but we also need to go beyond that and develop the competencies. And the task of design was to come up with learning experiences on part of the student that helps them develop a wide range of various competencies that go beyond the traditional competencies that have been developed for students in business school. And that sort of started a journey on a lot of literature review, a lot of corporate visits, a lot of discussions with uh, uh, development and chief learning officers in major corporations. And as a result of all of that, four categories of competencies were identified. Uh, the first category was uh, this concept of cognitive competencies, meaning enabling the students, primarily focused on MBA students, to be able to have the right knowledge bases, of course, have the uh, required business acumen. Uh, in addition to have the knowledge bases in various areas, more importantly, be able to integrate various areas of knowledge and apply it. Be strategic thinkers, be good problem solvers, and be able to deal with ambiguity and complexity. So again, going beyond the traditional set of courses and the core curriculum in business schools and developing broader set of cognitive thinking competencies. And of course, cognitive competencies are the entry ticket, if you will. Uh, no one can take effective action in a business environment or in an organization if they don't have this uh, basic set of cognitive competencies. And typically in higher education, that's where we have been focused. But then we also developed and articulated a, sort, a set of emotional competencies. Uh, issues like self-awareness for our students being able to understand oneself, coming in touch with their emotions, coming in touch with their uh, style of learning, decision making, and more importantly, understanding their weaknesses as an individual, because that's the best way of making people humble, you know, getting them to understand that there are certain weaknesses that they have as an individual. 
and also get them to uh, develop an understanding and appreciation of their strength as well so that they can develop confidence and also they understand what they're good at and what areas they need to excel and focus on in terms of their further development and uh, as a person and as a professional. Uh, another aspect of uh, this emotional competency is, is helping students develop resiliency. And particularly in our time, that's a very important competency for everyone to have. Uh, being able to not only bounce back from setbacks uh, and adversities, but also growing and learning as a result of facing those. Uh, we also identified a number of behavioral competencies that, of course, they need to built upon cognitive competencies and emotional competencies. This is the way people act and behave and project themselves. Skills like communications, listening skills, and personal conduct, um, which we categorized as falling in the behavioral competencies areas. And then lastly, we identified what we referred to as a set of relational competencies for I believe uh, business graduates, to be able to take effective action, they have to be able to connect to others in an effective way, uh, particularly others that are different from self. This whole issue around being able to be an effective team player, uh, be able to negotiate effectively, uh, be able to recognize and manage conflict in an effective way, and more importantly, being able to work across board, uh, but different boundaries that uh, exist. And we are using the term boundaries very broadly, br br uh, very broadly to uh, refer to all kinds of boundaries, anything from functional area boundaries to cultural boundaries, uh, social boundaries, and uh, racial boundaries. So the way we conceptualize uh, sort of business education is uh, really allowing students to be exposed to a number of learning opportunities and learning experiences that taps into these four dimensions. And in fact, if you think about it, what a person thinks, how they feel, how they act, and how they interact is a very holistic approach to uh, take for student development. So our belief and our vision is that what we really need in terms of uh, future business school graduates in addition to all the values that we have been hearing about and has been referred to in the global forums one and two, uh, are a set of these integrated interrelated competencies that goes beyond just what a person knows, uh, but really what kind of people they are and how they, uh, they deal with their emotions and more importantly, how they can motivate and work with others to be able to take effective action as a result of those uh, positive uh, values and ethical principles. So one of the challenges I wanted to give myself before coming up here today was to really keep my comments to five minutes or less. I think I have succeeded. So this concludes my remarks. And of course, during the Q&A, I would be more than happy to get into any specifics that might be of interest to you. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and let me also add my welcome to the Weatherhead School. It certainly, you picked a wonderful week to be here. Um, I put my comments together for this afternoon, and then I looked at uh, the subject of the panel, and I felt like a politician. And if you ask a politician a question, they'll promptly give you an answer. There's no assurance that the two are even remotely related. Um, what I decided to do was the focus of the panel is to look at the future, the future of management education. I thought it might be helpful for us to actually step back a bit. We did this uh, back in October of 2006. I thought I might share with you what's happened here at the Weatherhead School since then, before I step forward and tell you what we might be doing as we look ahead. Would that be all right? Just step back a bit. Uh, starting October 2006, we were well underway, given all the work going on at the Weatherhead School. Given uh, the generosity of a number of people in this audience and outside, we raised about $14 million focused entirely on these two topics, design and sustainability. We have two endowed professorships. We convinced Professor Buchanan to leave Pittsburgh for Cleveland, which achievement is own right. 
um, we actually created a research fund to fund research that in some manner linked these two themes together, knowing fully well that we had a great deal of field work to be done before we went much further. Uh, now, if that speaks to capabilities, let me tell you of the results. What has all that meant for us? Um, we formalized the center. We've, the number of publications in books and journals have kept going. We have two journals. The two journals we need to have in the school are here, the Design Issues as well as Journal of Corporate Citizenship. We've revamped the entire MBA program. Starting this fall, every single MBA student who enters our program will take a year-long course in sustainability or a year-long course in design. It isn't an option. It's a part of the curriculum. It's a part of the core requirement going forward. And these are field-based efforts. It isn't some theory that is just in the classroom. All of these insist that the student get out there and work with these topics, work with these concepts to make things happen. And probably the most exciting development more recently is a redesign of our PhD program. As many of you might recall, we have a practicing doctorate called the EDM, the Executive Doctorate Management, designed for uh, people who are full-time practitioners who come, who come from around the world, once every three weeks for three years. And we've had a remarkable run with that program. We've gone, taken a good hard look at it, and after 10 years, we decided we're ready to take the next step. Using a similar model, we designed a program, and we're admitting people into that class, I suspect, in January, uh, and it's titled Designing Sustainable Systems. It picks up on the three pieces that you've talked about and you will talk about, the design piece, the sustainability piece, and the notion of a basic system in its own right. It's something that we think really is timely and we have an, enough of a base now of uh, having done this that we think we can really do a marvelous job at it. Now if I look ahead, and I'll just, just highlight three issues. Some of these are uh, agreed upon, some of these are evolving, but as a dean I'll take the liberty of going ahead and pretending we already agree on all of these. Um, the first, let, let me give you a situation. If I look around the room, there's 600 of you, or some, somewhere thereabouts, you're all, you're all converts. You already decided this is a topic that matters to you. You already decided this is very important. Now, if I, if I clear out the room, brought in 600 CEOs into this room, and I asked them a question, how important is sustainability to you? The odds are, while there are a bunch of us who are skeptics here, the odds are good that most of them will say it does matter, it is important. And you say, okay, you ask the second question. You say, how many of you are doing something about it? The odds are there'll be a small fraction of them who will own up to it. So then you ask them a third question. If you think it's that important, why are so few of you doing something about it? And they tell you that they've taken care of the easy part, changing the light bulbs, recycling trash, things that are independent in their own right. What they tell you is I'm not quite sure what to do about the larger systemic change that's really needed to make things happen. I hear this tell you also, I hear your examples about the Kevlar from spiders and ceramics from uh, Albertone, but the question is, how do I go from where I am here to where I need to be there? So in some manner, what they're asking for is a few of those intermediate steps to help them get there. So it isn't that the intent doesn't exist, it is the mechanism, it is the design in some manner to help them move up to that place where they need to get to. So the first bullet point that I want to touch on is what David said in his welcome address to you on Tuesday. He says it's all about how. That's our role, we're an academic institution. Our focus ought to be, and I hope will be, constantly focusing on how do we create new frameworks, better frameworks, better tools, better ways of learning when institutions can take those first two steps. It's like being in a fog sometimes. You can't see the end, but you can only see two steps in front of you. The idea is give them two, they see two more. So one aspect of the school that I think is important as we go ahead is to make sure we never lose sight of the fact that our role is not to just be proponents of sustainability, that we are, but to also show people how to get there, how to make things happen, how to affect change, organize change. The second part is something that's been a pet peeve of mine for a long time. At, um, at the case, I, think, I suspect over 20 years ago, the medical school pioneered a curriculum. Till the case med school came up with the idea, medicine had been taught in a very traditional format. Students came into the med school. In the first two years, they took courses in pathology, anatomy, physiology, microbiology, biochemistry. 
Then they did the clinical stage where they started integrating these. Somewhere along the way, they said, look, this really isn't the way, right way to teach. So they went to what they call organ-based learning, where they would teach the cardiovascular system. And when they're doing the cardiovascular system, you'd have a pathologist come in, you'd have an anatomist come in, you'd have a physiologist come in, you'd have a biochemist come in, where they learned these disciplines in the context of something that was applicable, that was applied to, contextually-based learning, if you wish. I think somewhere along the way, as business schools, we need to get there. We speak a good game on interdisciplinary actions. We are all discipline-bound. David is an OB professor. I'm a marketing professor. Somebody's an accounting professor. And then we, we have a token integrative course in the second year that's supposed to do it all. But the reality is, if we're really serious about this, we start that from day one. We really do much more issue-focused learning, issue-focused teaching going into it, because that's what managers do. They don't isolate things and say, oh, that's a marketing problem, that's a finance problem. It's a business problem, period. So you take a look at it. So I think we like to see, in fact, the courses we have mounted, the design course, sustainability course, are not housed in any particular department. They don't carry a departmental designation. If we were searching for an endowed professor now, and we're happy to take applications, our focus is it is not housed in any one department. We're looking for the best candidate to fit the bill, and that person can decide which department he or she wishes to be in as you go forward. A third item I'd like to touch on, and this again, I'm afraid I'm laying out all my pet peeves in front of you. As management schools, I'm, I'm clear on that part, we are a management school, not a business school. Our competence is in managing organizational phenomena. That's what we do. That's what we teach. That's what we study. And somehow this arbitrary definition between business schools and schools and nonprofit organizations just don't quite carry water with me. What we'll also, because problems don't quite lend themselves to one extreme or the other. Just the definition of what you're talking about here transcends these areas, transcends these boundaries. In fact, if anything, the problems we're looking at insist that we erase those boundaries rather than in some manner reinforce them. And our goal is to be like to do what we do at the Weatherhead School, to be no less relevant to the nonprofit sector as it is the corporate world. It's something we think is vital. So I, I also want to make sure I left you enough questions for Q&A. Again, thank you for coming, and I hope it's been a wonderful couple of days. Well, we have heard about you know, very transformation, transformational experiences <clears throat> the Peter Drucker Society is extending all over the world, or the new competencies that are being built at Emory, which uh, you, know, you, you were so aware of the time that you didn't explain how you are going that. That is a very important question. Or the one year compulsory studies here as a precondition. I think that those things are very important. Um, well, I, I, wouldn't, I have many questions for them, but uh, I really would like, uh, I, I think that is a very good opportunity for all of us to make this a very interactive uh, session. After all, almost all of you here have a kind of vested interest in a business school, and you are really bullish about change. So here you have three uh, uh, possibilities, persons that can answer doubts or can share with you preoccupations and perspectives. So go ahead. Yes. Hello. Uh, I'm interested in your perspectives on the following kind of statement. Um, our accrediting bodies foster existing structures that encourage faculty um, with relatively narrow research and teaching backgrounds and emphasis on research uh, output that's relatively narrow in perspective. They seem more interested in looking back than looking forward and in valuing unquantifiable or, or valuing quantifiable output than unquantifiable impacts on students and society. In essence, what I would like to say to my dean, and I have said to my dean and gotten an interesting reaction is, Ask me not how many publications I have or how many conferences I've attended, but ask me how many lives I have touched through the work that I do and how I've improved society.
Well, I think that that's a very interesting question. Certainly, uh, in Prime, we have produced a, a paper, a web paper on research and the limits that research has at this moment, at the same time, the perspectives in a gradualist way that we should have. I would like to ask you uh, uh, in the same direction. So, we want new research, and that is true. But at the same time, the uh, journals are what they are. How are you going to incentivize a new type of research that is needed for this transformation? I think that goes perfectly with the question that was asked here. Please. Can I go? Sure, I'll, I'll give it a go. No, I, I, I'll read a question into that. I didn't quite hear the question, except the question you gave your dean. But um, let me read something into it. First, on the AACSP. Now, to me, it's easy from a dean perspective to find fault the AACSP. But in all fairness, what we see happening now, AACSP is saying, you as a business school, you decide what matters to you. You decide the way you'd like to evaluate your faculty your programs, tell us what it is, and we'll hold you accountable for what you already decided. So gone are the days where there was an arbitrary one-size-fits-all model. I don't think that's true anymore. There's a great deal more willingness. Now, when it comes to the measures of, um, I can count articles. I'm not quite sure I can empirically count how many lives one of my faculty members has touched. Uh, presuming I can identify them. But if your school can, I'd love to see that framework, because I'd like to use that as well. <laughs> Uh, offer some comments about that. I think uh, there's not an either or kind of situation. I personally think that uh, faculty members can be very effective, productive researchers and be great teachers and touch many lives from a teaching and development standpoint. Um, so I, my challenge to faculty always is these are not conflicting objectives, if you will. Uh, and uh, I think the other part of it is, uh, at least uh, in my school, one of the issues that we are addressing is the concept of a career life cycle for a faculty. That at different points in a career life cycle of a faculty, based on their own learning and experience, they can uh, shift their focus in terms of the emphasis uh, of where they focus uh, and target their energies. Uh, so I think between having a more inclusive perspective of uh, both research and teaching, uh, and as well as this concept of uh, changing focus over a career life cycle uh, possibly can answer some of those issues you raised. I think you probably suspect uh, where I come out on this issue. Uh, I'm not sure that Drucker would have gained tenure at many of the more established business schools in America. Um, and I think there are structural problems that are inherent in um, tenure decisions and uh, accreditation agencies. I think AACSB is trying hard. They've recently put out a piece on research uh, suggesting that uh, perhaps uh, a non-peer-reviewed article in the Harvard Business Review might be relevant to someone's uh, review. I mean, Harvard Business Review is probably read by the 250,000 most important decision makers in the field of business and practice each year, each, each issue. And most of the professional journals are read by other scholars. I, I have yet to meet a practitioner at many academic conferences that I attend as dean. I, we, we have a huge structural uh, mismatch here, and it's not to suggest that we should throw the baby out with the bathwater. We need serious scholarship, but we also need some courage from the academy. And we need some folks who are rewarded for asking tough questions and pursuing big ideas, not narrow, increasingly irrelevant insights, which, Jim, which drove Jim Collins from the academy. And Last I read, he, he was making major contributions to our, our field. Uh, in this sense, it's important to remember that uh, the co-conveners of Prime are ACSB and EFMD. We want them close because we want to do a rigorous, but at the same time, serious change. I, just add to that. I, I think this is an instance in terms of systems design, what, what David and Manuel and, and and Angel and others, and I, I was on, privileged to serve on the task force that shaped Prime. This is an opportunity to, rather than go lowest common denominator, is to, is to reach high and lift all boats 
So this isn't prescribed by AACSB, it, it's not a requirement, but what if, the, what if some of the best scholarship, what if you know, Rakesh Karana's latest piece you know, was published through Prime uh, rather than through s one of the academic journals? I think there's an opportunity here through Prime. Prime is a very serious initiative. And uh, it sounds like a bromide unless you've gotten into it, but the UN Global Compact itself requires signatories, and those of us in, the, in business schools who have signed on have to embrace and advance the U UN's Declaration of Universal Human, Environmental, and Labor Rights, as well as its Convention Against Corruption. Well, that's a normative construct that no business school had before the Global Compact came along. And then we have six principles of Prime itself. So th there is a template here for organizational redesign of business schools that's fairly well established now. And we have some guideposts, and I think if we go in that direction, we'll find that uh, accreditation agencies will catch up over time. Thank you. Many hands, please. Thank you, Manuel. Um, we heard earlier Jeff M. Melt using the metaphor of a reset. Um, if we apply that concept to the business school, does it just mean uh, stop, uh, shut the computer down, and start it up again? Or uh, do you really believe there is room for a fundamental uh, change in business education? And the, the piece I'm particularly interested in, Ira, and you use the term sort of offhandedly contrition. Do you think that the business school deans feel ashamed of what has been produced the last 20 years? In the interest of candor and, and transparency, uh, which characterizes uh, an AI process, I, I, I don't sense that, and perhaps it's not appropriate. Uh, I can't look at the carnage around us and look at the compensation scheme. Drucker was railing against what he called pigs at the trough in 1980 when CEO compensation to average worker compensation had reached 40 to 1. Well, by 9, 2007, it had reached 400 to 1. Uh, I think we went off the rails, and um, I think that uh, I, I can't un understand fully why we don't s have a sense of more obligation, if not contrition, perhaps because, as some previous speakers suggested, this has not been a normative enterprise, and yet, what's the, what's the Swedish word for business? Oh. So David, what, how does business translate into Swedish? Nourishing, Nourishing life. life. Nourishing life. The notion that we would train people to lead organizations and not make the world a better place has been in the academy. I mean, and, and there's some reason for this. We, we pursue truth in the academy. And we have to be very careful about being too value-laden because then we can become uh, proselytizers instead of, of serious thinkers and academics who are meant to be dispassionate. But I believe that we should bring a passion to the table, that our graduates should do, leave the place better than they found it. Um, so I, I think one reason we're not seeing as much uh, introspection is that things are moving so fast that we, we dodge the bullet as a profession. And, a combination of some others not seeing this as something that, you know, they came to us greedy and they left knowing how to do it. Uh, I don't think we think enough about first principles, and we haven't taken the Hippocratic Oath. You know, every doctor for 2,500 years has had to say, primum non nocere. Above all, first and foremost, I will not kill the patient. I will do no harm. I don't think we've, we've been producing a generation with convictions in, in them or in us that was premised on that Hippocratic Oath for management. Mm. Please, do you want to add something? Uh, what I'd like to add to that is this, there is a question in my mind, and that has to do with the question of values. Uh, somebody alluded to this, I think you, in your introductory uh, remarks, can you fundamentally change the beliefs and values of an adult, okay? Can, you may 
So if you think about a business school, particularly an MBA program, typically they come to us at the age of 25 to 27. So in terms of how much you can fundamentally change a person at that stage, um, I think there's a big question around that. Now what you can do, what you can help them with is to clarify and come in touch with their personal values, get to know themselves better, and help them understand in terms of the determination of are their personal values aligned with certain positive values or not. So I think this perhaps tendency to say that as a business school we can bring people in and completely change their thinking and value system. Uh, and if we don't do that, we have failed as business school. That is not perhaps a realistic expectation. Uh, so I think I just want to put that on the table as well, the issue of how much you can change fundamental belief and values of certain, of adults basically. Uh, I just have a point in response. You know, you said, are we ashamed of all what you produced last 20 years? I'm not sure if we are. When I look at the word reset, I think I look at, um, we've been fairly good research organizations. We've been relatively good as teaching organizations. We've been mediocre as learning organizations. And we've been abysmally bad as thinking organizations. And that's really what this, what this discussion is about, what these forums are about. How can we become better at learning? And how can we become better at thinking? And all the research button does is it gives you pause to go back and look at what you're doing and say, am I still in the right place? Should I be here in the first place? Uh, I must say that uh, you know this question has been debated already uh, throughout this uh, global forum uh, several times uh, in private circles. I mean, can you change really the values of people that come for an MBA that you were saying? And my answer would be, I think that you should, and you should try. Simply, they are entering a very dangerous profession a profession that has very important social consequences in their future decision making. And therefore, they have to be aware that if they want to be professionals in terms of managers, in terms of executives of companies in the future, they have to have certain responsibilities according to certain values. That doesn't mean that professionalism you know, is the solution to a profession that, is, you know, that has very tenuous uh, boundaries. I don't think that that is the answer. And I would say that maybe the oath that uh, Ira was defending uh, is not an either or. Maybe it's something that we should co consider in the future. But it's like in total quality management. The total quality management is systemic. It's not something at the end, you know, uh, that was in the past, the quality at the end. But, and I would say that what we need here is a systemic way of changing. And, but I think that here, in everything that you are saying, there is a sense of urgency. And the question here, therefore, is how can we bring this up to scale and fast enough? And I think that that is a pending question here. Anyway, let's go for more, more questions. I think that you wanted to talk before. No? Yeah? We all know the issues of uh, getting faculty to buy in. Um, is very, very simple. Pro probably the easiest part of your job. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Uh, I I'm just wondering, uh, <laughs> perhaps to close on an optimistic note, uh, could you share some success stories around issues Good. of sustainability, Good. how you, you've been able to move forward? Good. In the Good. curriculum or with faculty? When it comes to faculty yeah. buy-in, you can use any example you want. Yes, yeah, so uh, I I'll start off, if you don't mind. Uh, one of my colleagues was here at this global forum, Vijay Sate. He's one of the world's leading authorities on corporate strategy and institutional innovation. And he's recently completed a case study with one of our doctoral students on the birth of the uh, organic cotton uh, movement as a sector and through a case study on Patagonia. So I was. I sat and listened to Vijay and, and was thrilled that this is a direction that he's taking, uh, learning about the role of uh, NGOs, sitting with Walmart, l trying to figure out the intentionality and, and the, and the decision-making that would lead uh, the world's largest corporation to now embrace organic cotton and what consequence that might have on the world's ecology. Cotton turns out to use 25% of the world's pesticides. 
Um, so that's one example. Another is uh, a professor of accounting at Drucker, a uh, very established uh, fellow who, you know, counts the beans. And he's uh, devoted his research and is coming out with a book this fall trying to develop a new accounting methodology which will uh, account for values as social values as well as shareholder value. This is an important and maybe seminal contribution to our understanding of how this, some of the values that we've been discussing can be baked into corporate decision making and public reporting. Thank you. Uh, Miriam? I think one of the, uh, in terms of an example and faculty buy-in, uh, we spend a fair amount of time trying to articulate uh, our values as a school, uh, the ethical and positive values, and uh, try to capture those in a way that really conveys what the school is all about and what our community stands for. And we started by a phrase that says, our mission as a school is the development of principled leaders for global enterprise development of principled leaders for global enterprise. And it just wasn't a slogan. And then we really sat down and decided, well, what does that mean? What is, how, do, how do we need to act differently as faculty, as students, as a community, uh, to really be able to achieve that objective? And uh, took uh, a lot of work, a lot of uh, discussions, uh, a lot of collaboration. Uh, but I think uh, as a school, we, are, uh, we have made great progress in that particular area. Mohan, do you want to add something? Um, now, uh, we as faculty, and I, I can't, I'm one of those, we have a bit of the Mikey syndrome. We don't like anything when we first see it, anything different. Right? Um, and two old-fashioned words, uh, bribery, and then uh, a certain critical mass. You know, we had enough of a momentum with a few people who were committed. You tell them bash on regardless, you put some money behind it, and you tell the other faculty who feel that the other side is getting too many resources to say, if you want a piece of the action, step up to it. And once they get into it, they realize that they really, it really is exciting to be a part of it. So you, the whole point is to get it up and rolling. Maybe the systemic success story here is that, that uh, by now, everywhere in the world, any school that is, uh, you know, the granting degrees, and it's a serious institution, any business school, has sustainability as a point of, point of the agenda. I think that that is something that we know already. And we also know that there are 230 that explicitly have signed up to the principle for responsible management education. And that was before the crisis. And for many of them, this is just a recognition of what they are already doing. <clears throat> so I think that the change was already there. And therefore, there is a lot of hope you know, concerning this. Let's go for other questions. And I would like now to ask for two questions. Then you can pick up which one do you prefer to answer. But there are many, many hands. So we are going to max maximize well. here the, the procedure. Yes, please. The, the lady in blue there. Lady in blue. Uh, Xiao Hua Yang from University of San Francisco. Um, I just recently emerged from down the under. So for someone who has been away for 11 years, um, I have some perspective um, about American education. Um, I think the American education in general uh, has some systematic, systemic problem. Um, other countries are catching up with this problem, unfortunately. Um, the problem I see is, is it has a bad circulation. I will, use, I will use one example to illustrate that. Uh, a couple years ago, my 14-year-old daughter got a $40,000 scholarship to go to college. And I said, wow, you know, I thought, wow, I thought well, that was a huge amount of money. But after I came here now for a couple of months, I realized that wasn't that much money. So many universities charging that, mu uh, that much, uh, much, you know, much more. So if university charging students so much, how much they expect us to give to them? So the expectation is keep going up. They want more from us, right? So, well, then you can see the system, you know, keeping, they want more, can we actually provide more? The fact, that one fact that I, I got recently is 
the American universities, the tuition that has increased 400% in 15 years. So the question for us, is: have we really increased value 400% in 15 years? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Thank but, you. No, if oh, not, I, I think for the sake, um, well, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, uh, you want to continue, well, but please be. Just food for thought. Uh, yeah. We can think about that. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Someone wanted here to talk? Yeah, no, thank well, you. I just, uh, as a representative from business, I would like to ask the deans or at least give them an opportunity to give us a, uh, what would you like business to do? What would you like? Your con business constituents and your uh, stakeholders from business at each of your schools do to enhance and get the sustainable development opportunity moving in your school. Thank you. So you have two questions to answer. Uh, which one to, would like to contribute here? I, I'll take a crack at that first. I'm just giving Miriam and I a chance to think. I, uh, Chuck, setting aside the fact we'd like the, them to give us lots of money, I'll set that aside. Um, we'd like them to be uh, they're, they're valuable laboratories for our students to learn because this is something that has to be learned on the job. We learn by doing. So anything business can do to let us experiment, let us be a part of the learning process with them would be enormously helpful. Two, I think you add it up, the ability to some manner open up some systemic processes they have for us to take a look at would be very helpful because this is not something we can sit in a in an office with a computer and put models together. This has to be done in the field with live settings because the nature of the systemic problems that we have. So anything they can do to partner with us and provide laboratories for our learning would, go, would do a great deal. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, I just want to reinforce the comments in that it's a collaborative process. They need to partner with the universities um, in terms of teaching and development opportunities for the students and going beyond the classroom environment, so opportunities for project work, field work, not only in terms of development of students, but also research opportunities for faculty. Um, I think it's always a challenge for faculty to get a research site that is really willing to open and provide the data uh, to address some of these issues, research questions around sustainability. So it's in both areas of research and teaching and education. Yes, uh, amen to what my colleagues have already suggested. And if you have a new product or a new idea, let us be in on the design stage of helping you systemically um, and be your, your junior partner. That would be a privilege for our students and a learning opportunity for those of us who are faculty as well. To, to the woman's comment about tuition, it's undeniable. Um, it also has a perverse impact on those of us in the academy because rankings are driven heavily by compensation, how well our graduates do in the marketplace. So it, it's, dub, it, it's amplified and it's a structural problem that uh, is difficult to overcome. Needless to say, especially for those of us uh, like Mohan and I who uh, pre present and deliver, I hope with some degree of integrity, uh, on the proposition that we're a school of management. We want our graduates to go off and run NGOs in Kenya, as well as to get marketing jobs at P&G. Well, the NGO in Kenya is gonna pay about $32,000, and the marketing job at P&G is gonna pay about $92,000. You can imagine what that does to our ranking the more folks we have going out and changing the world through NGOs in Kenya. Thank you. Two people in the middle. Susan, please. Please don't go away. I'm a faculty member. You asked a great <laughs> question. I think there's a, the, and I'm not a dean, but I think there's a relationship between business and business schools. And I think if you speak more about sustainability and if you speak more about values and live your values and say this is what we want from our graduates, you say it first, we say it at the same time, our students are gonna say we wanna learn that because that's how we're gonna get our jobs. And if you pay for it and demand it, then they're gonna wanna learn it and then we can deliver it. So it's a two-way street. It can't just be from one side. So thank you for letting me say that. Thank you. Someone on your table also? 
Yes, um, Manuel, I'd like to respectfully flip the paradigm and ask a question of you regarding the Global Compact. And perhaps Dean Jackson would comment because you have both said a systemic approach more than anyone else uh, on the panel, not to leave the rest out, but it is that systemic approach that's at the core of my concern. And I love the compact. I've been a participant since 2001. And I see that it itself, 10 years ago, fell into the same anti-systemic trap. It broke the problem up into parts, environment, human rights, labor relations, and then added the 10th principle of corruption. And it's a silo approach to CSR as a worldwide movement. Can 2010's <clears throat> World Leadership Forum take advantage of this wonderful management energy and have the compact itself transform into a systemic uh, movement that says we aren't just addressing those 10 principles and those parts, we are addressing the whole system and changing the world with this economic collapse as our leverage point <clears throat> to an economic design for all instead of a win-lose economic design. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <clears throat> well, I would say that, uh, you know, I know very well the practice of companies that are trying to stand up to the, not to the standards, but to the values of the global compact. I, let me tell you that there are no silos here. When you're in a company and you embrace the 10 principles, what you do is to go you know, through them and say, which are the priorities here? Or things that either we can change because it's wise risk management, or that we want because they will produce value, you know, responsible value for the company. So companies don't understand it as silos. They understand it as, a, you know, if you want different issues of the same type of paradigm. And the paradigm is sustainability, really. Uh, but anyway, any idea will be more than welcome in the Leader Summit uh, of the Global Compact in June 23-24 uh, of, of, uh, of the next year, where we are going also to have the Global Forum for Responsible Management Education once more, and where probably we will see many of you there. Oh, more questions? I think Isabel wanted to talk there, and someone in the back. Thank you. My question is for Marian, and I was very interested and like very much what you shared about the different four different categories. And my question was, how are you going to implement this? This sounds like a big add-on on what you have already. Are you going to make them electives? Are you skipping marketing or? What? That's an excellent question. Uh, we took a whole year looking at our. MBA curriculum to see how we can implement this model, this developmental model. And what we have done uh, in terms of our so-called core curriculum, which is a required course, um, we have uh, a course that runs in two semesters in the first year that really focuses on integration, holistic thinking, strategic thinking, and problem solving. And we do that by having a team of faculty coming from different functional areas, if you will, that is very problem-solving oriented. We give uh, field projects to our students, student teams, and we ask them to draw on different faculty expertise uh, to address these problems. So that's, that's a core course. It covers the entire first year of the MBA curriculum. Uh, so that's an opportunity for students to think holistically, and do problem solving and strategic thinking. As far as development of some of the more emotional and behavioral kind of competencies, we start those developmental activities in the orientation, in the summer before they even start uh, coming to their business school uh, work. And we do that by first giving them all kinds of um, assessment tools in terms of helping them understand themselves better, uh, get a better handle on their strengths and weaknesses, and based on those assessments, we provide them uh, opportunities in terms of kind of courses that they take and the kind of activities they get engaged in both inside the classroom as well as outside the classroom in their study teams. So it's a whole program, a two-year program, if you will, that um, in a core fashion, meaning that they really, it's a requirement, it's not an, uh, a choice, an elective. Uh, that they need to participate in these developmental activities 
Some of them happen in a classroom, some of them happen in the field, in terms of field projects and uh, field work, and some of them happen in terms of um, coaching each other, peer coaching, uh, mentoring, and coaching by faculty and coaches, actually. So it's a uh, elaborate, complex process, but uh, we started implementing that last year. Uh, and your hunch is right in that if we wanted to make anything uh, sort of electives, uh, you know what happens. People who need it most choose not to mm -hmm. take those courses. So, uh, and I'm happy to take it offline and talk to you about specifics more. Thank you. I mean, I have to say, I'm going to win so many enemies because there are so many hands, you know, people that wanted to talk, and you have made such an interesting conversation for us. Uh, but it's not possible. I think that we have to wrap up here, and I would like uh, 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 Mohan to, to finish. Uh, uh, certainly, I think, I think that uh, the, systemic, uh, the systemic approach is there, it's in Emory, it's in, in case Western Reserve, otherwise we wouldn't be here. Maybe you want to add something? I'm glad to see it start, and I'm glad to see, delighted to keep it going. And thank you for coming. Well, thank you very much. I, I think that they deserve a big hand of applause from us.